Okay, so interesting question to ask at this point is simply, where are the wages? Like I see here that there's something having to do with impatience. There's something having to do with the interest rate, the rate of return on, on uh, capital. But how come I don't see anything about wages here? Isn't that weird? Well, I think the reason why that is, is because the wages, the wages, the level of capital is changing over time. Okay, but wages are based on labor. And labor, we've assumed, is inelastically supplied every period. Okay, so I, I ask here in the slide, if we were in class, I would ask you, you know, what is the difference between capital and labor? Forget about the real world, let's think about the mathematical abstractions that we've got here. So the difference in our model is that labor, it comes in one period and you just have to use it. So it's like, it's not intertemporal. It's only period by period. Whereas capital, it's something that you build up over time. So if you save more today, you'll have more capital tomorrow. Okay, so that's kind of the fundamental difference. One is use it or lose it. And one is this stock that you build up over time. Okay, so since the labor is use it or lose it, in a sense, we can kind of discount all of that to the very first period and consider all of our labor income as our wealth um, and then sort of spread that out along our, our, um, our lives. Like the agents in this model can do that. So the fundamental difference here is that labor is use it or lose it comes once every period, whereas the capital is something that you can build up over time. Okay. It doesn't disappear if you don't use it. Labor does. Okay, so what are we trying to do? Uh, what we're trying to do is find how capital stock changes over time. Ultimately, we wanna find a steady state where the level of capital per unit of human capital is constant. Okay, what have we done? We've described the household's problem and we've described, described the firm's problem. Both of them were taking prices as given. What are prices? Uh, prices are the rental rate of capital, the interest rate as I've been calling it, and the wage. There's two prices in this model. Remember, we've normalized by the price of output, which is just one. Okay. So if we want to find an equilibrium in this economy, we need to find uh, a level of capital or a path of capital such that the prices that uh, are implied by the firm's problem Remember the marginal revenue, the marginal effect of say capital on revenue um, must be equal to R. And then also in the household's problem, you know, the level of capital they have rationalized by R has to equal the amount of capital the firm has when, it, when, uh, when the interest rate is R. Okay, so basically we need to find one set of prices that's going to rationalize both firm behavior and household behavior for any given level of of the capital stock and uh, labor supply okay so as i say here in this slide this is where we take the model from micro to macro so far we've got the prices you know given the prices how do households behave given the prices how do firms behave now let's find how um, both of them uh you know Let's find prices that justify the level of capital stock for both households and firms at the same time. That's going to be our equilibrium. You know, our constraint is that the capital stock has to rationalize both household and firm behavior and the labor supply has to rationalize both household and firm behavior. Okay. So this is now the equilibrium of the economy. So are you ready? This is the big step, the big step where we move from micro to macro. There it is. So uh, you'll recall that previously we had little c dot t divided by ct is equal to little rt minus rho minus theta g divided by theta. Now we've replaced rt with f prime of little kt. Why is that? That comes from the firm's problem, right? This comes out, this expression is the household's problem little rt is equal to f prime of little kt, this is the firm's problem. Okay, so we're combining the household's problem and the firm's problem 
both of them have a little RT here. Um, and now we have this expression. Um, and uh, given this, what we're going to do is we're going to relate the level of capital to the level of, uh, or I should say, yeah, the level of capital to the level of consumption. Okay. So what are the dynamics of consumption? Well, let's draw a graph here, one of the, what they call a phase diagram in the textbook. Here we have the amount of capital per unit of, uh, physical capital per unit of human capital. Here we have consumption per unit of human capital. Okay, and we're gonna think at what level of capital per unit of human capital do we have it where consumption per unit of, hap per unit of human capital doesn't change. So I'm gonna flip back one slide. If we set this left-hand side equal to zero, you can see that we can find this level of capital because f prime of kt, it's always positive, but we've assumed that there's decreasing returns, right? We've assumed that, that, uh, um, that there's decreasing returns. So it means that, you know, this slope is getting smaller and smaller over time. So if we make this little k big enough, then since we're subtracting off these positive terms, eventually this thing will go negative. If we make this little kt small enough, and now we've assumed, recall, from the Inada conditions that the slope here is infinity, then we can make this thing positive. So there must be some point where we can find a little kt where uh, this right-hand side is exactly equal to zero. Okay, and that little kt we're going to call k star t. It's the point, it's the level of capital where consumption does not change. Okay, so then... We can just draw this line and say along this line, the, cap, the consumption, consumption will not change regardless of consumption's level, okay? If we're to the right, that's again where the slope is now shallower. So we're gonna get negative consumption growth. If we're to the left of this level of capital, that's where the slope of the production function is steeper. So that means we're gonna get positive consumption growth. Next, let's talk about the path of capital. Okay, so what's the change in capital? This is the same as in the solo model, almost. So what do we have here? We have production minus consumption. In other words, investment or savings. And what do we have here? Well, we have n plus g times little kt. Recall that in the solo model, we had delta plus n plus g times little kt. That was our break-even level of investment. If we want to maintain the same level of little kt, how much little kt do we need to invest? Okay. Um, why don't we have a delta now? We assumed at the very beginning that there's no depreciation. Okay. So all we have to do is just grow the capital stock enough that we keep up with the fact that A and L are growing. Okay. So we have to invest enough so that this capital stock can grow proportionally to maintain the same level of little kt. Right, this little kt. Okay, so investment minus break-even investment, that's our change in the capital stock per unit of human capital. Okay. So this is the same as before. So we're gonna get this curved line. Let me show you where that comes from. So recall that we're trying to graph CT against KT. So if we set this K dot T equal to zero, okay. Now let's put CT on the left-hand side. So we can get a graph of CT against KT. What do we get? We're going to get this thing. Now notice this F of KT, again, that's something that begins by increasing very steeply. And then it kind of flattens out. This one, it's negative, And you'll notice that it's just linear. So you know, um, eventually, this f of kt, as we increase kt, it won't be able to grow as quickly 
as this negative force pulling down consumption. So, you know, uh, so that's why we're going to get this curved graph that you're going to see on the next slide. We got one force, which is the production function. And we got another force, which is this negative pull of the, uh, of the break even level of investment. Okay, so we get this. All right, so along this curve here, the capital stock doesn't change. If we're below this curve, that's the area where the capital stock is growing, which makes sense, right? It's where consumption is low, capital stock is growing. Above this curve, where consumption is high, capital stock is decreasing. Okay, so putting these two curves together, recall we've got this line along which consumption is not changing, we've got this line along which the capital stock is not changing. Okay, and then we can combine our arrows. In this direction, consumption is on this side of the C dot equals zero line, consumption is increasing. On this side of the C dot zero line, consumption is decreasing. Underneath this curve here, capital stock is growing. Above this curve here, capital stock is shrinking. Okay, so we can combine this and we get sort of a different direction for growth in each of these four quadrants. Okay, so up here, um, both capital stock and consumption are, are shrinking. Over here, consumption is growing, capital stock is shrinking. Down here, both capital and consumption are growing. And here, capital is shrinking, but, uh, excuse me, capital is growing, but consumption is shrinking. Now, let's use this phase diagram to think about what happens if we start with an initial level of capital stock. All right. So given the structure of our model, it turns out that people will optimally choose uh, savings such that they go onto this path that's gonna ultimately take them up to the steady state. Okay, so you might say, why is it that people in this economy don't save uh, less and consume more, right? That would be like C, this point C, this point B, or this point A. The reason why is because you can see if we kind of look at the path that um, capital and consumption would take if we were to choose C, B, or A in these economies, you can see that consumption is just gonna grow over time, whereas savings or capital stock is gonna decrease over time. If you choose C first, it starts to grow, but then eventually it starts to decrease, okay. So what's happening in this area, you know, we're all kind of going off in this direction. What direction is that? That's the direction of Ponzi scheme. Okay, that's the Ponzi direction. Why is that? Oh, terrible handwriting scheme. Why is that? Because look at this. Our savings levels are dropping and dropping and dropping. Our consumption levels are growing and growing and growing. We're borrowing more and more and more to, to um, to fund our consumption. So what have we done? We've outlawed that. We said, no, you can't do that. We have a no Ponzi scheme condition that says you can't choose a level of consumption higher than F. That's not allowed because then you'd run up against this no Ponzi scheme condition, okay? Well, why don't people choose a level of consumption below F, okay? Well, let's take a look at this path D. So you can see what happens here is that consumption is low, uh, it grows a little bit, eventually it starts falling. You know, our capital stock is growing, we're saving a lot, but our consumption level is falling and then eventually we get to the point where we don't have any consumption at all. You'll note here that if we would have saved a little less and we would have consumed a little bit more, then we would have more consumption in every period, right? So I mean, if we would have chosen a D, something higher than D, a little bit higher than D, then we would actually get more consumption at every point along this path. So the point is, um, it can't be optimal to choose D because we could have got more consumption by moving up a little bit and saving a little less and consuming a little bit more. Not only more consumption today, but more consumption along the whole future path of the economy. Okay, that's gonna be true up until we get to F. If we save, so you know, if we consume any more, then we start, hitting the Ponzi scheme. Okay, so F is like the best we can do without borrowing against our future forever. Okay, so that's gonna be the optimal F. And what'll happen is we'll kind of travel along this path 
until we get to E. And you can see that E here is the steady state. That's the point where little k doesn't change and little c doesn't change.